bank session is uh, is an in-house presentation with a few other people from outside, but it's mostly people. So that if I were doing a brown bag presentation, I would be doing things that uh, are, I'm, I would be talking to people who know a lot about my research already. And so it would be an update how I'm extending the research and things like that. Here is a real quite different situation because here we have the luxury of having uh, 15 visitors uh, who uh, are positive psychology students from Melbourne. Uh, now, your undergraduates or is this an undergraduate program? Yes, yes. Okay, so your your background uh, is uh, obviously more basic than that. So I'm, I've tried to come up with a presentation that is broad and general enough so that it's intelligible to you and still uh, meaty enough that it's it's a normal brown bag presentation. Now, when you come up with compromises, sometimes you get the best of both, and sometimes you get the worst of both, but you can give me some feedback on that later on. Um, let's see, before we begin, uh, I handed out uh, some brochures about uh, a self-conference that is coming up. This is a really wonderful conference that's going to be in uh, Melbourne, uh, the 25th to the 28th of September. And so if any of you wanted to go to that, uh, that, that would be great. The registration material and so forth is available there. Well, let me go ahead and get started with uh, it, with my presentation. Herb, do you want to mention that there's a practitioner stream in that? Because these are all practitioner types. Yeah, I know. Oh, are we well, going to do that? This is the brown bag presentation. No, I mean the self conference. The self conference, the same. The self -conference okay. has a stream that might be interesting to be able to check applying positive psychology. So it's not only for researchers. Yes, yes, there's definitely uh, at the self conference, there's uh, practitioner workshops, and Joseph uh, is in charge of organizing those. And so if after this presentation you want to talk to him more about uh, the practitioner workshops, uh, b uh, by all means uh, do so because uh, he can give you the, the best information about that. Okay, so uh, if I were just giving a very broad introduction, I would say uh, this is a little bit about my introduction to, uh, to IPPE. Uh, but you don't really need that, you know. Uh, you know these names, or at least some of these names, that uh, are some of our stars here. And up there I have my office, and it's just above uh, here. And so this is just, if I'm doing an international conference, that's my introduction to uh, where we are. This is a little who I am. Uh, uh, who I am is I, I publish lots of articles, I, I get lots of good grants, uh, my research is highly cited, uh, and so by all those traditional academic criteria, uh, uh, I've been uh, a, a good solid academic for a whole many long years. Um, here I've tried to uh, give an overview of my substantive and my methodological uh, interests. Actually, probably my forte is the synergy between the substantive and uh, the methodological. So almost all of my substantive research is strongly methodological, and some of my research is primarily uh, uh, methodological with a substantive orientation or a substantive underpinning. But uh, a lot of the methodological work I do is developing interesting ways to solve problems that have arisen from my substantive work. So in my research, there's a real synergy. And that's getting harder and harder to do because uh, the quantitative sophistication is going ahead at such leaps and bounds that people are becoming somewhat dichotomized in terms of being substantive researchers and methodological researchers. And there's not an awful lot of researchers uh, who try and uh, keep a foot in both camps. Having said that, uh, our institute is clearly an exception to that because we have a variety of researchers, the two that I'm looking at right now, as well as lots of others that are strong methodologically and strong substantively. So we're, we're pretty good at that. The focus of my presentation is self-concept. 
uh, the enhancement of self-concept, positive self-beliefs is a major goal in lots of different fields, education, psychology, social services, sport, exercise, business, lots of different areas. Uh, academic self-concept will be a focus of a lot of what I'm talking about, but self-concept more generally is an important mediating factor. It facilitates desirable outcomes. So for example, in education, uh, a positive academic self outcome, uh, academic self-concept is both a desirable outcome but also a means of facilitating other academic accomplishments. If you feel good about yourself in relation to, uh, to school, you're likely to achieve uh, more and uh, continue further. The benefits of feeling positive about oneself transcend traditional uh, disciplinary and cultural uh, barriers. Interventions that change skills, aptitudes, or achievement are unlikely to have long-lasting effects unless uh, you also change people's self-beliefs. Um, positive self-beliefs are also at the heart of the positive psychology revolution. And indeed, uh, uh, one of my presentations at the International Positive Psychology uh, uh, conference was, uh, I was given the challenge or uh, the request to present self-concept and my self-concept research as a cornerstone of a positive psychology movement. So <clears throat> let me begin by talking a little bit about uh, the measurement of uh, self-concept. So uh, the Shagelson model historically was uh, um, was a very important foundation for my research and lots of uh, other research as well. In the Shavelson model, uh, it's a hierarchical model of self-concept. So uh, you have uh, general self-esteem or global self-concept at the top. And this is divided into academic and non-academic self-concepts. The academics are divided into self-concepts in particular domains or school subjects and the non-academic are divided into social, emotional, and physical self-concept. So that's sort of the structure of uh, self-concept. When uh, Shavelson first proposed the, uh, his model, there were no existing instruments that came close to uh, matching what he was looking at. So it was clearly a theoretical, hypothetical model. But uh, I worked with Rich Shavelson and developed a set of uh, instruments, the self-description questionnaires that were based upon this model. And that was my early work uh, in the self-concept. And it was important because it established a sound <coughs> measurement foundation for measuring self-concept. And it allowed me to do an awful lot of very interesting research that wouldn't have been possible if there hadn't been solid measurement instruments. So the ability to measure whatever it is that you're wanting to look at is certainly an important uh, starting point. Uh, I developed uh, questionnaires for pre-adolescents, adolescents, late adolescents, young adults, the SDQ 1, 2, and 3. Uh, these had really good psychometric properties, which was quite important, uh, good reliability. Uh, clearly defined factor structure with uh, distinct domains. This was a really important one because at the time there was an argument that, uh, that self-concept was unidimensional, that there was just one big factor, sort of a global self-esteem, or there were multiple factors that were so highly correlated that you couldn't differentiate them. But in fact, when we got the measurement instruments, the different domains are remarkably distinct, so that the average correlation between the different uh, domains is between 0.1 and 0.2 on the different instruments. So uh, they're really quite distinct areas of self-concept. Based upon this early research, the uh, Shavelson model is the one uh, at the top. We <coughs> came up with a revised model for the academic component. And particularly the issue here was that the, um, the math and verbal were uh, areas were so distinct that they couldn't be put into a single global academic uh, uh, component. And so we came up with an alternative model uh, that divided uh, a range of, academic, of core academic subjects and argued that there was uh, a, a math academic and a verbal academic that uh, were needed rather than a general academic. 
And then uh, I picked this up in some later researches to come up with a theoretical explanation for why this was the case and why it was necessary. Uh, there's a variety of different areas. Oh, just for curiosity's sake, uh, I think I sent, a, uh, indirectly, I sent uh, a number of you some copies of uh, some materials, some sort of overviews of my research. Did you have a chance to read that? Uh, I don't know, how do I? Uh, hold up your hand if you actually looked at it. <laughs> okay, so some of you do. Well, hopefully the, that will make this a little more, uh, a little easier to understand if you uh, read some of the material. The starting point is the reciprocal effects model. Uh, this, the question I'm asking here is what comes first, self-concept or performance, or do they uh, work with each other? So this is one of those chicken egg uh, sorts of questions in terms of which comes first. Historically, there's been two competing models. The skill development model says that good performance leads to good self-concept. The self-enhancement model says that good self-concept leads to good performance. I believe, therefore I am. And this uh, self-enhancement model is central to the positive psychology movement. However, we argue that both these models are too simplistic and propose a reciprocal effect model. So here's the prototype of the uh, reciprocal effect model. Uh, Self-concept and performance are each measured on at least two and hopefully three or more occasions, time one, time two, time three. Each, con uh, each construct is measured with multiple indicators. These are uh, different tests uh, or different items on the uh, questionnaire. The blue line is the self-enhancement. This says that uh, prior self-concept uh, contributes to subsequent performance above and beyond what can be explained by prior performance. The, uh, the skill enhancement model, uh, the red pass, say that performance, uh, uh, lead, prior performance leads to better self-concept. And the reciprocal effect model says that both of these uh, are inacting, so that uh, performance and self-concept are both a cause and effect of the other. There's, there now exists a large body of support for the reciprocal effect model. Uh, a colleague, Valentine, did a meta-analysis of uh, 55 reciprocal effect model studies, and they showed that there was good support for the reciprocal effect model that generalized over uh, age, country, type of achievement, time interval, and a whole variety of design features. So the self-concept is an important uh, outcome variable and plays a central role in the mediated effects of desirable outcomes. Support is particularly strong in education, but there's a growing body of research that shows that the conclusion is generalized to other domains as well. Now I'm going to talk about frame of reference uh, models. Uh, frame of reference says that when you make an evaluation of yourself, uh, you're making that evaluation in relation to some standard or frame of reference. And so these are look, these, some of the models that I'll be talking about are looking at different frames of reference that people use and what are the implications of them. So uh, math and verbal achievements are highly correlated. Uh, are uh, correlations of 0.5 to 0.8. You may think you're good at one or the other, but if you're good at one, you tend to be good at the other as well. However, verbal and self-concepts are nearly uncorrelated. People think of themselves as math persons or verbal persons. So the IE model was designed to explain why uh, verbal and math self-concepts are so distinct. Theoretically, this finding contradicted the original Shavelson model and led to the revision that I talked about earlier. Okay, so according to the IA model, there's two separate comparison processes. There's the external comparison process, and this is a social comparison process, so I compare my self-perceptions of my, mo my own math and verbal abilities with the abilities of other students in my classroom or school. And I use this external relativistic uh, uh, impression as one basis for forming my self-concept. So if I'm the brightest uh, student in my class, I'll tend to have a positive academic self-concept. The internal di or dimensional comparison uh, uh, process is a, something more interesting, or at least it's uh, more unique. 
According to this iterative like process, I compare my self-perceived ability in math with my self-perceived verbal ability. Uh, uh, I use this internal relativistic impression as the second basis for arriving at self-concept. So if math is my best subject, I'll tend to have a positive math self-concept, but my verbal self-concept won't be as good as my math self-concept. So whatever you're best at, you'll tend to have a higher self-concept, and whatever you're not best at, you'll tend to have a lower self-concept. And this is the case whether you're good at everything or you're not very good at anything. Uh, there'll still be that differentiation within domains. Yes, okay. So this is the internal external frame of reference model. And so uh, we've got uh, math and verbal achievement that are highly correlated, and math and verbal self-concept that are almost uncorrelated. Now, the, according to the IE model, the blue horizontal paths reflect the effects of achievement of academic self-concept in the same matching domain. Not surprisingly, these are pretty positive. So uh, if I, I have good verbal achievement, I have a good verbal self-concept. Uh, the ones that are more interesting are the cross paths, the red cross paths relating achievement in one area to academic self-concept in a non-matching area. These are predicted to be negative. In order to have a good math self-concept, I need to have good math skills, uh, the blue horizontal line, uh, that's clear. But uh, my math skills also have to be much better than my verbal skills. Uh, hence, good verbal skills will actually detract from math self-concept. If I'm too strong verbally, I can't be better at math uh, than I am with my verbal skills. So the red uh, passage predicted to be negative. Similarly, being too good at math at achievement will detract from my verbal self-concept. <coughs> so, uh, we've tested these in large-scale studies all over the world and uh, there's good support uh, for these. However, these cross-cultural differences are confounded with other differences. Uh, so that when we're comparing different studies uh, in different countries, there's different countries, there's different ages, there's, uh, this, the samples may or may not be representative. So there's all sorts of difficulties in trying to compare results from different countries. So one of the uh, databases that we use a lot in our institute is the OECD PISA data that largely overcomes these, uh, many of these uh, issues. So here we represent the world's largest cross-national study of the IE model the, uh, based on the OECD uh, data, the PISA data. This is representative samples of 15-year-olds from 26 countries uh, based on very strong data, based on uh, several thousand students from each of the countries. So uh, the, IE, the IE model uh, predictions were supported. The two horizontal paths are substantial and positive, math achievement to math self-concept, verbal achievement to verbal self-concept. The two cross paths, the red ones, are negative. So verbal achievement to math self-concept, uh, minus 0.2, and math achievement to verbal uh, self-concept, minus 0.26. Using a 26 uh, multi-group structural equation model, we showed that these results were reasonably consistent across the 26 different uh, countries. This, so this was particularly strong support for the cross-national generalizability of this finding. Let me now go uh, and talk about the big fish little pond effect. This is uh, another one of these framework reference effects that I've looked at. Um, educators, parents, and maybe you uh, assume that uh, there's academic benefits to attending uh, an academic selective school or attending uh, schools where the ac average academic achievement is high. Uh, this naive analysis, however, fails to take into account the higher abilities and other pre-existing differences. So a better test would be to compare academic outcomes after controlling for pre-existing differences. This calls for relatively sophisticated value-added models for the evaluation of these effects. In an educational context, we pr uh, propose the big fish little pond effect based on a whole variety of theoretical perspectives from different disciplines and different areas of psychology. According to the big fish little pond effect, academic self-concept is influenced substantially by the ability levels of other students 
in addition to your own ability level. Students compare their academic skills with the skills of other students in their class or school and use this relativistic impression as one basis of forming their academic self-concept. So students have lower academic self-concepts in high ability uh, schools than would equally able students in mixed ability or lower ability schools. So here we can so here's my attempt to depict the big fish little pond effect. So this is supposed to be a fish in a little fish pond in a uh, in an ocean, but I don't think that one's real good. <laughs> uh, but let me move on to the uh, the model that we're looking at. Uh, this is the first big fish little pond effect study with a small Australian study. And the blue path shows that individual ability is substantially and positively related to academic self-concept. The brighter I am, the better my academic self-concept. However, the red path from school average ability is negative. The brighter everyone else is, the lower my academic self-concept. So uh, next we uh, looked at the big fish little pond effect in a large nationally representative U.S. study. The results closely replicated uh, the Australian study, and they also showed that the results were largely a function of academic ability rather than socioeconomic status. These results uh, show that uh, this was a primary function of academic self of academic achievement, school average academic achievement rather than socioeconomic status. Okay, so uh, we've also done uh, big fish little pond effect studies with the PISA studies, PISA 2000, 2003, 2006, and 2012. As shown here, each subsequent PISA study included a larger, more diverse sample of uh, countries. However, the results continued to be similar. The effects of individual achievement were positive. The effects of school average achievement were negative. So across pretty much all of the different countries and all of the different PISA uh, data, 123 country PISA samples, uh, the results were consistently negative. I think that there was uh, uh, one where it was one out of 123 that was positive, 114 that where they were significantly negative. Also an interesting thing that uh, there was something called the bright student hypothesis. It said that uh, it's only the kids at the bottom of their school where their academic self-concept drops, but that isn't the case. The big fish little pond effect uh, affects the, bright, the brightest kids just as well as uh, the not so bright kids. In fact, the brightest kids, their self-concept might drop even a little bit more than uh, the kids that are relatively less bright. Uh, this demonstrates that the big fish little pond effect is one of psychology's most cross-culturally universal phenomena. The effect of school average achievement was negative in all but one of 123 country samples and significantly so in 114. Um, the big fish little pond effect has been replicated in lots of different studies and is now pretty much accepted, uh, uh, at least within educational psychology research. Uh, it's quite an interesting finding. It's important for self-concept theory. It's also quite remarkable to get this level of generalizability in education because every country has totally different educational, highly different educational systems. And so to get a phenomena that generalizes that well across the different countries is really quite interesting, particularly given that in some respects it's paradoxical uh, in that at least a lot of people uh, uh, initially believe that going to an academically selective school would help your self-concept rather than hurt it. Okay, but a devil's advocate perspective can say, so what? What are the practical implications? To address this, we uh, looked at the U.S. High School and Beyond uh, study. Uh, this was a large representative sample of American high school students, 36 students from each of 1,000 schools surveyed in year 10, year 12, and two years after graduation from high school, time one, two, and three. It was specifically designed to include many of education's most uh, important outcomes. So here's the path model that, uh, that we looked at. Uh, the critical question is, what are the effects of school average ability on year 10, year 12, and post-secondary outcomes after controlling for student background? 
Let me begin by summarizing some of the uh, outcomes that we looked at. In year 10, uh, the outcomes were self-concept, academic and general, coursework, taking advanced courses, academic effort, time on homework, coming to class prepared, school-based performance, school grades, and educational and occupational aspirations. In year 12, the uh, same outcomes were included along with a new battery of achievement tests. And two years after graduation from high school, the outcomes were uh, the number of semesters of university attended and uh, measures of educational and occupational aspirations. The overarching question is what is the effect of school average ability, academically selective schools, on each of the many educational outcomes? Clearly this is a complex model, but the results are easy to uh, summarize. Controlling for background and initial ability, school average ability effects were negative for all year 10 outcomes, all year 12 outcomes, and all post-secondary outcomes. There were no positive effects of attending academic and self, uh, academically selective schools on any of these outcomes. 15 of the 17 relations were uh, significantly negative, two were non-significant. School average ability also negatively affected academic self-concept, the big fish little pond effect, and educational aspirations. However, the effects were also negative for self-esteem, course selection, school grades, standardized test scores, occupational and, uh, aspiration, and subsequent university attendance. There were initial, additional negative effects uh, for year 12 and post-secondary outcomes beyond the uh, many negative effects at year 10. Many of the negative effects of school average uh, ability were mediated or could at least could be explained in part by academic self-concept. Okay, so uh, although the uh, big fish little pond effect is robust, there's some limits to the generalizability of it. So uh, because I coined this phrase big fish little pond effect, I every once in a while uh, get these requests from fishing journals. <laughs> <laughs> fishing journals to review. You know, the, 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 the journals are getting pretty desperate to uh, get reviews, and so they look at keynotes and I say, oh, this guy's published 20 studies on big fish little pond effects. So, <laughs> I'm asked to review articles on uh, the size of ponds and the size of fish and uh, fish productivity. Um, I haven't actually pursued that research. <laughs> Let me now go on and talk about some, this is sort of the background. Let me go and talk a little bit about uh, some more recent research. This is something that I call the cute model of academic self-concept, where I'm trying to put together some, some of these different perspectives and uh, several of the people in the room here are co-authors uh, with me. Uh, so this is sort of a summary of uh, some of the different uh, effects that we've talked about already. And what I've tried to do here is put all three of them together in a single uh, study. So the first one is the reciprocal effect model, uh, and that's temporal comparisons. So uh, part of my self-concept is based upon temporal comparisons. My current accomplishments relative to past accomplishments. Uh, the second one is the big fish little pond effect for social comparisons. Uh, how do my uh, accomplishments relative to those of my classmates and peers? And then there's the dimensional comparison or the internal external frame of reference model. How do my accomplishments in one domain compare to my accomplishments in another domain? So what I've tried to do is put these three three different perspectives, these three different frame of reference models into a single uh, model. So we've got a large uh, longitudinal database. Uh, uh, this is with, uh, this is a German study with a German colleague who uh, has recently joined uh, the institute. And uh, we'll, I, within the study, I'm able to look at all three of them, all three of those effects within a, a common uh, statistical and methodological framework. So ways one to five are five yearly data collections in this longitudinal study. There's a single conceptual model that provides tests for the three, three theoretical models of academic self-concept. But also, because it's longitudinal, it allows me to look at the developmental consistency of these effects. So 
the first one here is the IE model that is passed from math and German uh, grades in year four to math self-concepts in years five to nine. These provide uh, tests of the internal external frame of reference model. Consistent with predictions, the red paths from math grades to uh, math outcomes are positive. The blue paths from German grades to uh, uh, math outcomes are negative. So that was support for the internal external frame of reference model. Um, in that square, that highlighted square, uh, are the paths that uh, look at the reciprocal effects model. So we're looking at the effects of math self-concept on subsequent math achievement school grades and test scores and the effects of achievement on subsequent uh, self-concept. Uh, again, we were able to show that there was good support for the reciprocal effect model and that there were uh, positive paths leading from self-concept to subsequent achievement and there was positive uh, paths leading from achievement to subsequent self-concept. <coughs> and then the third is looking at school average ability and uh, these show that, uh, that the effect of of school average achievement measured by a variety of different ways was uh, negative uh, on uh, self-concept and continued to be negative uh, over time. The, uh, so the, it's not the effects are negative at the beginning, they continue to be negative over time. If anything, the effects grow larger over time. So this was uh, so in this model, I was able to put these three different frame of reference models together into a single statistical model. One of the things that was important is is that each even when I put all of them together, uh, there was support for each one of them considered separately. So it wasn't as if they canceled each other out or anything. So these are three quite separate effects that uh, work in tandem in terms of uh, the formation of academic self-concept. <clears throat> now I'm, uh, the next one that I looked at is another sort of frame of reference effect. Uh, it's the year in school effects. This is the negative effects of acceleration and positive effects on retention on academic self-concept. So the big visual pond effect is based on the assumption that academic accomplishments of classmates form a frame of reference, a standard of comparison. However, being in a school environment with highly able students as operationalized by school average achievement isn't the only way that students' frame of reference can be uh, altered. For a variety of reasons, such as acceleration or starting school at an early age, students can find themselves in classes with older, more academically advanced uh, students who form a possibly more demanding frame of reference. Similarly, due to starting school at a later age or being held back to repeat a grade, students can find themselves in classes with younger, less academic students uh, than would normally be the case of same age uh, schoolmates. Based on the logic of the Big Fish Little Pond effect, uh, I proposed and found that relative year in school being one or more years ahead or behind the student would have a negative effect on academic self-concept. The effects of academic self-concept were negative for de facto acceleration starting earlier skipping grades and were positive for de facto retention starting late or particularly, and this will be a quite interesting one, repeating a grade. So repeating a grade had a positive effect on academic self-concepts and uh, consistent with the big fish little pond effect. Now, let me make sure that uh, it's clear what I'm talking about relative year in school. So uh, the actual year in school that you're in uh, minus the average year in school for 15 year olds in the same country. So if most of the kids uh, uh, positive values indicate that the student has been accelerated, started young, or skipped a grade. Negative values indicate that a student has been retained, started late, or repeated a grade. <coughs> okay, so in this study, uh, the, here's the conceptual design, but the critical uh, features of it are looking at school average achievement and relative year in school, and the main outcome variable is math self-concept. 
So I'm predicting the school average achievement will have a negative uh, effect on uh, self-concept, but relative year in school will also have a negative effect on academic <coughs> self-concept. So here's the uh, uh, linear, uh, largely linear positive effect of individual achievement on math self-concept. The brighter I am, the better my academic self-concept. Here's the negative effect of relative year in school, and here's the negative effect of uh, school average ability, uh, the big fish little pond effect. Uh, we looked at a whole variety of different uh, moderators and mediators and so forth, and the finding was really quite robust. Uh, the negative the negative residual, uh, negative uh, relative year in school effect uh, uh, is leading to being relatively older than classmates, irrespective of how this came to be. So one of the interesting aspects of this is, is that uh, there's a whole variety of more or less separate literature, some of looking at acceleration, some looking at starting early, some looking at starting late, some looking at repeating a grade. The argument here is that all of those can be subsumed by this relative year in school, and there was reasonable support for that. So uh, none of these effects, although each of them had effects considered separately, they could all be explained in terms of this relative year in school effect. Uh, there's a study I'll talk about with uh, Radar Peckron that was looking particularly at repeating a year of school. Phil Parker has recently done a study uh, showing, uh, extending what I was looking at and showing that the negative uh, uh, effect of relative year in school extended to university entry and uh, entry scores and arguing and showing that these could be fully explained in terms of academic self-concept. So uh, it's quite an interesting finding, particularly given that uh, uh, there's a belief that, uh, that repeating a grade is the worst thing that you can do. So this study is looking specifically at that phenomenon. And um, it was a complicated study. Let me see if I can unpack this. So, no, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, so here we've got, in the blue box, we've got covariates. These are things that we controlled for. The critical aspect is repeaters. So that uh, in each of five waves of data in each year, there was a relatively small group who repeated. So we have these five independent groups of repeaters. Uh, and so each of those was represented by a dichotomous variable. You can see this is sort of a, a quasi-experimental study where we had repeaters and non-repeaters. And then we had a set of 10 outcome variables. And the 10 outcome variables were pretty comprehensive. They're uh, self-concept, self-efficacy, <laughs> anxiety, but also some social variables and several academic variables, school grades, and, uh, and uh, standardized tests. Uh, so, uh, for example, people who repeated here, uh, we were measured again the following year, and so we were able to look at their effects in wave two, controlling for the effects here and controlling for the effects, uh, the covariates, but we were also able to follow them up in three years. So each of these groups of repeaters had at least one set of 10 outcome variables uh, as control variables and up to three ways of data to uh, look at the follow-up. Okay, so here's the main findings. Uh, the light one effects uh, for the first year of repeating a greater, uh, lag one means the next year after, and so what were the effects there? Now, uh, the effects are almost all positive, and the biggest effect is for math school grades. Now an effect size of one is just remarkable for educational research. I mean, people get excited when they get an effect size of 0.2. Almost all of these effects are positive. Most of them are statistically significant. So this is saying that the effect of being held back and repeating a grade is positive for almost everything. And what's interesting is that these effects were maintained 
in the follow. -up. So it wasn't as if they just were there for the first year. Now, uh, the, the math grades, it, this was a uh, math focused uh, study, and so uh, the math grades, there was much stronger controls for uh, uh, the math score. So that's probably why the math grades effect is, uh, is uh, so much larger. You can also say, well, wait a minute, this is a little dubious because uh, if I uh, was in year five and I repeated year five, well, uh, I'm doing the same material again, so I ought to be able to do it better. But an effect size of a whole standard deviation higher is quite remarkable. But what is also equally remarkable is that these effects were maintained over the next three years. So it wasn't as if they uh, dropped back. The only effect that was negative was uh, the math test. It was just barely significant. Uh, but even this one was a little bit funny because uh, the math test that these kids were given uh, the second year was based upon the test that the kids that it were accelerated took. And so they were taking, they were being tested on material that they hadn't been taught because uh, they were a year behind. And so if we compared their test scores with those of uh, students who were at the same year in school they were in, uh, their test scores even were better. So, uh, so from that one's, a, that one's an interesting one. That, that's an interesting one to look at. Uh, Phil's study uh, looking at uh, relative year in school was looking at it in terms of whether kids go on to university or not. There's quite a bit of interesting research, and it's, at this point, it's pretty controversial uh, because there's still a lot of people that believe that uh, asking students to repeat a year. Now, the, when I'm trying to figure out a theoretical rationale for this, obviously it fits in nicely with my self-concept and my big fish little pond effect. But uh, I also realized that it, were, it uh, made sense from a mastery learning kind of perspective. A mastery learning perspective argues that uh, anybody can learn almost anything if they have enough time and assistance in doing it. Some people take longer than others. And our educational system these days is not very good at giving people individualized instruction and help and so forth. And so one way uh, uh, of giving people extra time is having them repeat a year in school. There's also uh, something uh, called the Matthew effect. And the Matthew effect is that uh, little differences early on become big differences later on. And so if you fall behind, particularly in mathematics, in one year, and you don't master the material, but you're going, but that you go ahead and go ahead to the next year. You're going to be so far behind the next year that you'll never catch up. And so there's some interesting uh, perspectives as to why repeating a grade might be not so bad. Uh, I think I probably talked about that. Uh, now the study that the last study I'll talk about is uh, looking at uh, five uh, frame of reference effects with PISA study and uh, one study. So here I'm putting together the social comparison stuff, looking at the big fish little pond effect, uh, the negative uh, relative year in school effect, the dimensional comparison, looking at the internal external framework reference model, but also putting them together, saying, uh, looking at the effects of school average achievement on different subjects and seeing if they have contrasting effects uh, in the same way they do at the individual student level. Um, so I've also added a new effect here. Uh, this is called the paradoxical cross-cultural academic self-concept effect. So previous research based mostly on U.S. and East Asian countries has shown that U.S. students had higher academic self-concepts even though they had lower levels of achievement. So, uh, uh, so there's a lot of U.S. researchers who have looked at this and uh, come up with all sorts of idiosyncratic uh, perspectives. Uh, I extended this research uh, looking at the Middle East uh, Islamic <coughs> countries that had even higher academic self-concept and lower levels of achievement. So that it wasn't something that was specific to uh, U.S. and Asian countries. It's a more general finding. Academic self-concepts and achievement are positively correlated at the level of the individual student, but negatively correlated at the country level. This has been labeled the paradoxical cross-cultural academic self-concept effect. 
However, there's a natural this is a natural extension of the big fish little pond effect, not a paradox. Students in each country form academic self-concepts in relation to other students in the same country, not students from different countries. Thus, at a macro level, extension of the big fish little pond theory predicts that country level achievement has a negative effect on academic self-concept in the same way the school average achievement has a negative effect on academic self-concept at the more micro level. So, uh, the five frame of reference effects that I'm looking at here, uh, a negative effect of country average math achievement, uh, uh, a negative effect of school average achievement, the big fish of the pond effect, a negative effect of individual student uh, year in school relative to age, the uh, relative year in school effect. Then when the social, uh, uh, the dimensional comparison, the negative effect of individual student reading uh, math self-concept, the IE model, and a new one is the positive effect of school average reading on uh, math self-concept. So the opposite direction. Okay, so uh, the results are showing again the uh, the linear, largely the positive, largely linear effect of individual students, the uh, negative effect of school average achievement, the big fish little pond effect, the negative effect of oh, I've got something. I think I've got these labels right. I might have them. I, I, the, the, those two might be reversed. I have to check that. In any case, there were negative effects of relative year in school, school average achievement, and country average achievement. So <coughs> those three negative frame of reference effects uh, were evident. So this is one of the largest uh, studies that's ever been done looking at each of the uh, uh, each of these effects separately. Uh, clearly, the first is trying to put them all together. So uh, what I look at with a multi-level model uh, based upon PISA 2012 uh, that's based upon 68 uh, different countries. So I evaluated this in relation to statistical significance for each country considered separately, but also in relation to residual variance components as country to country variation and the effects across the different studies, the different countries. <coughs> I mean, uh, the red uh, uh, ones are statistically significant in the predicted directions, the black effects are <coughs> a non significant. Uh, <coughs> effects. So uh, the big fish little pond effect was the uh, largest of the effects, but each of these different uh, uh, frame of reference effects were significant there as well. Uh, obviously too big to look at the, but basically what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the generalizability of these effects over uh, 68 different countries. The piece of data is uh, a unique opportunity to look at the generalizability of the effects to other academic constructs as well. So there's some limited uh, research on the generalizability of these effects to different constructs. Uh, so what I did also was using this piece of data, I looked at the effects on a variety of different uh, constructs. And uh, the ones that are shaded in gray are the ones that are non-significant. But other than that, uh, the effects are significant and in the uh, predicted direction. The mass-specific effects are the ones that are strongest, but that's understandable because we're looking at the effects of mass-specific uh, achievement and so forth. So uh, what we're looking at here is that uh, the effects are generalized reasonably well over a whole variety of uh, different constructs. Um, this one gets a little tricky. This is, uh, this is sort of a, a looking at profiles. So uh, there's 19 effects in each of those columns. And uh, so that's, a, uh, that's 19 uh, numbers. And so what I asked are, uh, what's the relationship between these with this, 
and with this. So I could make a, a correlation, that I call them profile similarity indices. And uh, I was able to show that uh, these, these effects are fairly uh, consistent across uh, the, uh, the, the different constructs. Um, this one gets a little esoteric. I don't think I'll, I'll bother going into that now. Some of the people who understand it will be able to say, aha, and uh, it'll, if you don't, it, uh, it'll just take too, it'll be too complicated to go ahead and explain it. Besides, I've got something more interesting that I wanted uh, to talk about, kind of stepping back. Um, one of the one of the interesting issues is that some of the most prestigious uh, and highly cited articles in uh, education and psychology are meta-analyses, and uh, there's some journals that only publish meta-analyses. And I have a couple of times uh, tried to publish the uh, the PISA studies. Uh, in these articles, and I sent them back and said, no, that's just one big study, that's not a meta-analysis. So here I'm arguing that the PISA studies are much stronger than a meta-analysis in terms of looking at generalizability. Particularly if the generalizability that you're wanting to look at is a universality of the effects. The problem with, uh, uh, with meta-analyses is, is that you can only do a meta-analysis based on published studies. And the published studies are mostly uh, based in English language journals. They're mostly based on uh, middle class participants. Uh, if, uh, in social psychology, they're mostly based on uh, US university freshmen and sophomore uh, students. So there's not a good pretense that uh, there's a universality of the effects. There's relatively, in the meta-analysis, there'll be relatively few uh, studies based upon third world countries. There'll be uh, 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 studies that don't get significant differences won't, will typically uh, not be studied, uh, not be published. Uh, there'd be relatively few studies that are in journals that uh, aren't English language journals. So there's, uh, and then in meta-analysis, there's a, a real chicken egg sort. Well, there's an issue that uh, uh, you're putting together different studies that are based upon different designs, different measures, and you're making some sort of gross assumptions that these measures are somewhat comparable just because they have the same label or for whatever reason. Uh, all of those are problems with meta-analysis. Uh, particularly the PISA studies, they don't overcome all of them but they overcome a lot of those studies. So they're clearly more universal in covering a much wider range of countries than does a meta-analysis. Uh, uh, they're based on good, solid uh, 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 measures, uh, better measures than at least lots of the measures that are included uh, in a meta-analysis. More importantly, they're comparable. Everybody is doing the same uh, is doing the same materials, and these materials have been already tested uh, so that they are shown to work reasonably well across different uh, 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 cross national uh, populations. So, uh, now, of course, there are limitations to the uh, to the uh, piece of study because they're only looking at one age group, uh, and the data is mostly cross sectional. Uh, so that it's hard to look at some of the issues of causality. But the argument that I'm making here, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, the journal editors buy it, that this is a better meta-analysis than a meta-analysis, uh, at least in many, at least in terms of looking at what I'm referring to as pan-human uh, uh, universality or generalizability. Uh, the big fish little pond effect has some really interesting implications uh, that go against a lot of what's being done in school systems all over the world. Uh, maybe less so, but maybe not in some countries. Uh, uh, there's the assumption that if you go to an academically selective school that there's going to impart uh, psychological benefits, but the big fish little pond effect shows the, uh, the opposite. 
There's a worldwide inclusion movement to integrate academically disadvantaged students into mainstream regular classes. This is based at least in part on the assumption that these students are stigmatized by being in special education classes with other disadvantaged students. However, the big fish little pond effect shows that academic self-concepts fall when disadvantaged students are put in mainstream classes. Not only that, but it's not just the academic, it's the social. The social self-concepts fall as much as the academic. These kids are not being, uh, uh, they aren't feeling included, they're feeling excluded. Uh, the, uh, the relative year in school effect is hypothesized to reflect the net effect of any event that leads to being relatively overly younger than classmates. Uh, uh, educators claim that holding students back will have negative effects. However, uh, some of the research I talked about today suggests that uh, the opposite is the case. So in a rapidly changing world, the development of academic self-concept is fairly important. Academic self-concept predicts subsequent coursework selection better than corresponding measures of achievement. Academic self-concept form in high school contributed to the prediction of long-term educational attainment eight years later, beyond the effects of school grades, standardized achievement, IQ, and socioeconomic status. Despite growing sophistication of academic self-concept, major theoretical models have tended to develop in isolation. The integration of five different frame of reference effects uh, serves to further uh, their claims that they're a pan-human phenomena and underlies the importance of considering their implications when policy practices are being formulated. Thank you. study of doing meta-analysis of a phenomenon in which you have different studies, different evidence from different countries, but you have the same data and pizza and that was a separate study to actually compare the two? Yeah, we did that with the, uh, with the IE model. Uh, we did it, and well, we did do it. Uh, 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 one of my German colleagues, uh, who's a meta-analyst, analyst, and uh, has worked a lot with dimensional comparison theory, he did uh, uh, a meta-analysis on, on that. I said, you have to include the pizza data. Well, no, but what no, your wait a minute, argument. Wait a minute, okay. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he said, well, I can't include the pizza data because the sample size of the pizza data is bigger than the sample size combined of all the others, so it'll swamp it. And I said, yeah, but uh, they're looking at two different things. And you can look at, you can compare the effects of the two. And so we did the juxtaposition of the meta-analysis and the pizza data looking at the uh, internal-external frame of reference okay. model and showed that they were both uh, uh, consistent with each other and that okay. they, uh, the, the average effects of the PISA were uh, similar to the average effects uh, in the uh, meta-analysis. And so that argued uh, for the generalizability of the, uh, of the data. But I don't think that's done very often. And that was sort of ex post facto, because I said that if you're going to involve me in the study, then you have to include the PISA data. And so I sort of twisted his arm, but it turned out to be a strength uh, rather than a limitation of the study. I guess the other thing is, is that with the meta-analysis, you don't have access to the raw data. So uh, you, can, you can't look at the generalizability of the effects across individual student characteristics because you don't have that data. Whereas with the piece of sorts of stuff, uh, you can. Other questions? Surely some of you must be uh, uh, challenged by this big fish little pond. Yeah, go ahead. In the like effect um, results, there's you have two lives, actually the effect sizes were close to zero or they were different to the year one and the year three or four. I wonder why that is. Uh, those were lag effects. Those were uh, effects at year three controlling for year one. So these were incremental effects above and beyond year one. But the, the one for year four were like very high again. 
Uh, yeah, and, and I'm, but remember that was only one cohort because uh, if you re the design, there was only the first year cohort could possibly have three follow-ups. So each follow-up was based upon a smaller number, and so uh, uh, the standard errors of those were also fairly large. Uh, but the the important aspect of that research was that uh, the direct effects were positive uh, uh, for the first year. There were relatively few direct effects for subsequent years, but the uh, total effects, that, uh, including the mediated effects, continued to be uh, uh, to, if anything, grow larger over time, so that there were quite consistent effects. That one's going to be quite an interesting one, because educational researchers argue very strongly uh, that uh, holding students back is a bad thing. I have a more entry question. Were the students who repeated or got pushed forward and things like that, was it within the same school that they were originally a part of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wonder what happens when you have a selective school and a like, normal school that are co-located. So there's students, I think they're in different classrooms, but uh, like for example, here in Sydney, Chatswood is like that. So you have the selective and then the, the non-selective schools are sharing facilities and probably physical yeah. location. Uh, w uh, we've done a three-level model where we've looked at the effect of school average achievement class average achievement, and then of course the individual student. And uh, class average achievement trumps the school average achievement. And uh, there's a bunch of social psychologists who have done, uh, what's it called, the, uh, I've lost it, what's it called? Uh, proximal, local dominance. Huh? Local, dominance. local dominance effect. And uh, uh, they found that your immediate frame of reference uh, uh, dictates even when uh, you know that it's that silly. So they brought kids in, uh, university uh, first year psychology students, and gave them uh, a test and gave them bogus feedback. And uh, they also gave feedback to the other people that were in the room. And then they, uh, and so uh, the manipulation was how th that person's score compared to the other people's score. And they said, you shouldn't take too much account of these other people because uh, this was a particularly good group and the average scores that we have nation nationwide are this. And uh, those average scores nationwide didn't have any effect to speak of. It was the other people in the immediate room. So I suspect that in the same way that the classroom trumps the school, that even more so in this situation. So it's your immediate uh, frame of reference rather than a broader one, which is interesting. I mean, you don't have to do that way. I mean, surely if, you, uh, if, if you're good enough to get into a selective school, you can pat yourself on the back and say, well, I must be reasonably right. But it just doesn't work that way. We, we've pushed a lot trying to find a reflected glory effect, the positive effects. And uh, although I don't have good evidence for it, I suspect that there's probably a reflected glory effect when you first get the letter saying that you're in this new school and you haven't attended a single day of school. But uh, uh, we were able to show that even fairly early on, uh, there's negative effects and they certainly grow larger over the first year uh, in academically selected schools. Yeah. In regards to the Marsh Cube effects, mm -hmm. I know you. I know that there aren't any uh, moderator variables that wipe out the effects or reverse the effects. But I'm wondering if there are um, any reliable or consistent moderators of at least some of those effects. Um, I'm you know, thinking about neuroticism, for example. Um, and relatedly, if we know anything about um, what mediates these perception frame of reference processes. What's going on in people's heads when they form a self-concept? How are they, what information specifically are they pulling from their environment to uh, adjust their self-concept? What's going on? Okay, uh, let's see. Jens, one of my uh, uh, German colleagues, has been looking at giving prompts 
uh, uh, to begin with. And so uh, uh, he, can, uh, he, he has people write an essay about why math and, uh, mathematics and verbal subjects are complementary and go together. And uh, he's able to alter, to some extent, the uh, internal external frame of reference effect with that. So I'm sure that there are ways of doing it. But the, most of the moderators that we've looked at aren't very, uh, aren't very good. Now, the issue with looking at psychological moderators is that uh, if you take uh, the self-concept scale and divide it in half and call it self-concept one and self-concept two, Self-concept two will mediate most of the effects of self-concept one because they're canceling each other out. Uh, anxiety is, uh, 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 controlling for anxiety will reduce the big fish little pond effect uh, substantially, but anxiety is correlated with academics. Anxiety in mathematics is correlated with academic self-concept in mathematics, 0.85. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's you know, it's not clear whether uh, what we're controlling is anxiety rather than academic self-concept, or whether we're controlling academic uh, self-concept. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it gets tricky. But we've looked at quite a few moderators in the big fish little pond effect with the piece of data, and we haven't found anything that uh, uh, reduces the effect substantially. I mean, with some of them will reduce the effect. And even then, it's not clear whether we're controlling for something that comes before, we're actually just controlling for uh, uh, um, academic self-concept itself. And then you get into tricky questions about causal ordering. Yeah, yeah. And in regards to the self-enhancement effect, um, are there any um, other uh, phenomena that are influenced similarly? Do individual differences in self-enhancement in that model, mm -hmm. are they related meaningfully to other variables well, that you've examined, maybe? I'm, I'm trying to understand the psychological significance of this self-enhancement effect. Is it a hubristic thing? What is it? Okay, I don't look at that in my research. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's mostly looked at in psychological and social psychology uh, lab studies, where uh, they uh, bring people into a lab, lie to them, give them false feedback, and then ask them how they feel about themselves, and they feel a little bit better about themselves, and so they call that self-enhancement. And then they walk out of the room, and 15 minutes later, uh, it, it, there's no difference. Uh, and one of the problems also is that a lot of the self-enhancement uh, uh, work works is working with global self-esteem, and that's a really rubbery concept because it uh, uh, is not clear what that means. Whereas the most of the material that I'm working with is uh, academic self-concept that's most that's much more closely anchored. Uh, one of the uh, studies that we did. Uh, uh, we've got a self-esteem scale that we include in lots of the different instruments that uh, uh, we measure. And uh, uh, self-esteem is never very related to mathematics. Mathematics, people don't feel good about themselves overall because they're good in mathematics. But what we found in this study was um, that whatever instrument uh, the self-esteem scale is embedded in, uh, it becomes more highly correlated with that. So there's a, uh, a assimilation to the context of the other items. So that uh, when I have the uh, self-esteem embedded in a physical self-concept, uh, self-esteem is much more related to physical self-concept than it is in other studies. And when I have uh, self-esteem embedded in uh, an academic uh, self-concept instrument, then self-esteem is much more highly correlated with academic. When I have self-esteem in a broad instrument with lots of scales, uh, 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 self-esteem is most related to physical appearance at all ages, which is discouraging. Uh, uh, physical and social, less so academic. Uh, in a German study that was all math, I was quite amazed to see that the general 
the self-esteem is highly related to mathematics achievement. I've never seen that before, and I'm sure that this is because he asked 250 questions about mathematics. Uh, so there, there, there are funny contextual effects. We're out of time. We're 15 minutes over. Okay. All right, so what I will do is I'll close now.